Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, we we are we are live and Stefan, uh, welcome to Indonesia Bitcoin Conference 2020. Uh, so uh, I would like you to introduce yourself to to the audience uh, first. Sure. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I am known mainly for my podcast. It's a self-titled show called Stefan Levera Podcast. I've been doing this podcast now for over four years, interviewing many of the leading people in the Bitcoin space, as well as having a focus on Austrian economics, which I think is, there's a strong connection there in some ways. So that's the main thing I'm known for. I also work at Swan Bitcoin. So Swan is a platform, swan.com where people can learn about Bitcoin and buy Bitcoin. And so we also make a lot of educational materials available. Uh, and otherwise, I just do a lot of things around organizing things in, in terms of Bitcoin meetups or attending at Bitcoin conferences and speaking. So that's mainly how I'm known in, in this world. Okay, that's great. Uh, and if you don't mind, might you tell a bit about Swan, perhaps? Yeah, sure. So Swan is a, basically a Bitcoin company that helps people buy Bitcoin. And then we also have a range of products around that. So whether you are an individual or whether you are a business or a high net worth individual, Swan can help in terms of if you want to purchase Bitcoin. We also have an advisor platform for financial advisors who want to be able to talk to their clients about Bitcoin. We can help them with that. We also have a, a new app, a Swan app. And also coming up, we have Pacific Bitcoin, which is a Bitcoin conference that's going to be in LA, November 10th and 11th. So those are some of the things that we do over at Swan, um, but we are really known for promoting Bitcoin education and Bitcoin community. And so we have a lot of resources available for free. So for example, Gigi's book, 21 Lessons, or another book called Inventing Bitcoin by Jan Pritzker. So we make a lot of those things available for free. We also have uh, Swan Signal, uh, a podcast about Bitcoin. We also have Hard Money, which is a more professional level produced show about Bitcoin. Uh, so those are some of the things that we do over at Swan Bitcoin. Sounds cool. Hmm. Well, uh, okay, so let's get back to the time where you uh, first heard about Bitcoin. Uh, what's your story there? Yeah, sure. So for me, that was in like most people the first time i heard about bitcoin i thought it was a scam or i thought it was like fortnite box or like world of warcraft money or something weird like that what really made it click for me was this article and actually it was by eric Voorhees back in december 2012 oh, was when i saw oh, when i saw that article now i think he wrote it a little bit earlier but that was my moment that was my orange pill moment of realizing oh wow this is actually challenging central banks and it's taking money away from the state. So I'm all about that, that's great. So basically from then on, I couldn't stop thinking about Bitcoin, talking about Bitcoin, writing about Bitcoin and so on. So basically I got into Bitcoin late 2012, early 2013, and I've been there ever since basically. So I rode through various bear cycles up and down yeah. But I certainly, I came from a more libertarian Austrian e economics perspective. So I was already primed in that way and I was already a bit more tech savvy. So I think I in a sense that helped me have an easier time understanding what Bitcoin is. Of course, I understand for many people, that's a bit alien to people, this concept of money that's like not part of the government, not part of any corporation. It's a yeah. decentralized open source system. That's difficult yeah. for most people to get their head around. Um, and so I've spent a lot of my time over the years just teaching people about Bitcoin in whatever way I can. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that because uh, usually people associate money with uh, some kind of nation or state or government, right? And when you when you get Bitcoin, it's, it's hard to comprehend that, okay, so, wow, can money really exist without state? Mm, maybe, maybe not. Or yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting, and learning uh, experience, so to say. So you said that uh, you you are uh, you are first liber libertarian and uh, and then uh, you made uh, Bitcoin uh, later, right? Yes. 
That's right. Yeah. Although I know for a lot of people, it's the other way around. They learn about Bitcoin and then they start learning about Austrian economics and libertarian ideas. Now, not everybody who uses Bitcoin is a libertarian, I understand, but I, th yeah. I would say they have certain beliefs that are similar with libertarians, even if they are mm -hmm. not a libertarian themselves. So that's kind of, I, 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 I think it's fair to argue also that certain libertarian beliefs contributed to how Bitcoin and the crypto anarchy and the cypherpunks were thinking about it decades ago. So I think that there's, there's some connection there. Um, and some of the early cypherpunks, people like Tim May, were yeah. libertarians also. I see. That's interesting. Uh, maybe I should uh, learn about those uh, people because I have to be honest, I have never heard of uh, Tim May before. But yeah, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's an influential guy from the cypherpunk movement. So there are some very influential texts and things like this. You can read, for example, at Nakamoto Institute. So my friends Pierre mm -hmm. Rashad and Michael Goldstein, they started that mm -hmm. back in maybe 2013. And it's got a, a lot of resources mm -hmm. that are there showing some of the history behind how Bitcoin became what it is. So mm -hmm. it, Bitcoin didn't just come out of nowhere. It, it, it is the result of 30, maybe 40 years worth of computer science and uh, crypto anarchy and libertarian thought that all combined to create this package that today we know as Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. those are a few things that, uh, you know, we can get into. Um, but uh, yeah, I've also got the slide deck as well. So if you want me to share the screen and go through that or whenever you're ready. Oh yeah, please, please. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, whenever you're ready. Yeah, sure. Okay, let me do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me just share my screen. Hmm. I'm just trying to get the right window. If you okay. have difficulties, then I can I can share my screen. Uh, but first, you have to share your slide deck to me. Yeah. That, uh that should be yeah it's okay i can um i'm just trying to find the exact way to share that that sorry uh just trying to get the right windows open Um, I'm just kind of struggling to get the one second. See if I can share this. You can yes. see that screen. So let I me can... just um, is that you can see the screen now? I can see the screen now. Okay, great, great. Okay, mm. so I'm just trying to close the other window. Okay, so let me just put it in a slideshow mode. Okay, here we go. So you can see the slides. That's all fine. You can see that. Yep. Okay, great, great. Okay, cool. So I thought I would just walk through a few ideas um, that I put together just very quickly, a few threats to adoption, um, as mentioned for this talk. So obviously, for a lot of people, volatility is a big one. I understand that it's going to be volatile in the first few years. And we are still very early in Bitcoin. So I think it is just part of the cycle of adoption is that we will see these big herd moves in and out over time. Um, but each each time, generally speaking, it's growing every cycle or however you want to call it. Now, I'm not saying it's, it has to be every four years. Like sometimes you could have like a one-year cycle or a two-year cycle. We don't know exactly, but I think that's just part of it. I understand that can be difficult for people, but the way I think of it is basically, you have to think of this like it's a long-term thesis. And so when you... Uh, saving with Bitcoin, you should be thinking four years is probably the minimum time threshold and really 10 years or longer should be the, the, the threshold or the time frame that you're thinking about. Now, of course, you can transact with Bitcoin without necessarily trying to save in Bitcoin. So certainly you can do that too. But I, I would say expect it to be volatile for some time to come. Um, I think also for some people we're living, we're dealing in a world where maybe there's people who are just apathetic 
they just sort of don't care. And maybe that's the broader issue. Um, I don't see this as like a big existential risk to Bitcoin. I just think it's more like that's part of the reason why people haven't adopted it now. So, for example, people are just busy with their job or their family and things like this, and they haven't spent the time to actually read and learn about Bitcoin and why they should use it. Now, not everybody will do that. Some people will just use the tool neutrally. But we need, uh, it's in a way what will happen is I, I think for some people is they will unfortunately be pushed into Bitcoin because they have no other realistic option. And yeah. so we'll see what happens with that. Of course, government regulation can cause friction, things like AML, KYC, sanctions laws, uh, other regulation of Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin running a Bitcoin node or software development. All of these things could create friction or make it more difficult. And actually, one of my friends, Safety Namus, the creator or the author of the Bitcoin standard, has commented, perhaps one big risk of Bitcoin is that governments actually return to a sound money standard. Uh, of course, I believe that's going to be difficult or potentially impossible over the long term, because mm -hmm. there's just always going to be that incentive for them to centralize. And yeah. let's not forget also that under a gold standard, if you actually want to verify the gold, it's a much higher cost. So in various cases, depending on how um, how deeply you want to verify, you might actually have to melt down that gold and recast it. That's very expensive. Whereas yeah. when you send a Bitcoin transaction and you are using that combined with your own Bitcoin node, it doesn't, it just does not, it's nowhere near the same level of cost, right? You can run a Bitcoin node, something like two or three hundred dollars for the device, and then your internet and power cost. And that's basically it which is extremely yeah. cheap when you can think of it like this. You can be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, billions of dollars over a Bitcoin node that's and verified on a device that's a few hundred dollars. So in terms of some of the risks or attacks on Bitcoin, the big one a lot of people talk about is, oh, okay, what about a mining attack? What if the government or some evil entity were to try and do a 51% attack? Now, um, there's a particular Brains blog post. Now, for listeners and attendees, I can share this slide deck with um, the uh, organizers of the conference so they can share that with you later. But the basic gist of it is uh, Brains have done a blog post showing as of January 2021, the mere hardware cost alone is $5.4 billion. And that is not even taking into account how difficult it would be to actually acquire all those miners uh, because the number cost is one thing, but once you started doing this in practice to actually get that much hash power hardware, it would just be so much more than this. Um, and so people run these numbers. So for example, there's a site crypto51.app and that shows you, let's say the one hour cost to attack Bitcoin today, is about $815,000. But even that is not actually reflective of the true costs. Uh, and remember to sustain that attack, you have to keep paying that price uh, because otherwise the normal transactions will get through. And yeah. of course the network can over time evolve and improve in relation to some of these things so for example if there's a lot of censorship and you really want to get your bitcoin transaction mined you have that option of paying a higher fee with your bitcoin transaction yeah. so just talking through just to give people a high level understanding of perhaps some of these ideas of course bitcoin and custodians now custodians who hold your bitcoin could seize your coins or stop you from transacting with your coins. So that's why, of course, in Bitcoin, as I'm sure you've heard a thousand times and you'll hear it a thousand times again, not your keys, not your coins. So that's the important message that is out there for people. Now, of course, if you're new to Bitcoin, maybe that's part of the journey, but you should ask your friends, oh, hey, how do I actually get a hardware device? Or can I do it on my phone? Can I receive the coins out of the exchange into my phone? So that way I'm not trusting the exchange or the custodian and I'm using my own security and my own wallet to store my coins because that is probably one angle on which it might get easier to mm -hmm. capture the system 
And another example, and we saw this recently with the blow up of various entities in the space like Celsius and BlockFi going through trouble and Babel Finance and Vault and um, the Voyager, another big one in Canada, they were offering yield. So because they were offering yield, a lot of people put their coins on these platforms. So in some way, you have to avoid the trap of getting caught up in some yield, not in a, in a custodial platform. So mm. that's why in Bitcoin, there's such a strong focus on non-custodial adoption. And so that's why you should prioritize that. And even for your friends and family, you should try to coach them on how to be their own uh, custodian instead of trusting another custodian. To hold their own keys, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm. Um, now, there's a lot of altcoins. And in some sense, they're an attack on Bitcoin. And okay, you could argue maybe not every single one, but a lot of them in a way are attacking Bitcoin. Uh, some of them are explicitly attacking Bitcoin. For example, Ripple, I believe it's the executive chairman of the Ripple Foundation, put up $5 million to mm. basically fund an attack on Bitcoin's security. But yeah. the problem with these altcoins is that you can't copy Bitcoin's difficulty. You can't copy the value stored. You can't store. You can't copy the difficult, the security, or the battle that hardened Bitcoin. So you simply can't copy Bitcoin. So that's an important point that people should consider and, and understand. Now, whether that is for yourself or potentially, if you are you're listening to this, uh, you're watching the conference, that if you are get, are being asked these questions by your friends and family because they may be saying, hey. Um, what do you think about this other altcoin? What do you think about this coin? It's important that you do your own study, do your own research, and you don't even have to believe me, right? Part of the ethos here is you need to go and verify. So yeah, you have to yeah. Do the research, and there's no shortcuts mm. here. Of course, I can try to guide you. I can give you some resources, but ultimately, everybody has to learn to verify for themselves, at least to the level that they are able to, in terms of why Bitcoin and why Bitcoin is unique uh, in terms of AML and sanctions laws. So some of these practices are bad from a liberty point of view. They're bad from a property rights point of view. Now, some users will choose to, let's say, only acquire coins without any KYC. And I, you know, I totally understand that position. Um, to be clear, Swan, for example, I work at Swan. Swan is a uh, KYC platform uh but th there are multiple risks to think about here the way i'm seeing this is we need to grow the overall number of people who are holding bitcoin and ideally self-custodying that bitcoin and the way i see it is i would rather somebody hold at least some coin that they had to go through kyc know your customer process and mm -hmm. self-custody it than that person to hold zero coins uh, exactly so that's how I'm seeing it. And I understand that for some people, when they first come in, it's difficult for them to go straight to non-KYC coins. So uh, that's how I'm seeing this, uh, but mm -hmm. it does represent an angle potentially in the future. So for example, if coins are, depending on which country you're in or around the world, obviously Bitcoin is a global phenomenon, governments or other actors could go to those exchanges and say, hey, give me a list of everyone who bought Bitcoin and how much they bought. So that's a possibility. Now, of course, you have to do your own assessment on what you plan to do about that. But at least if everybody is stacking sats and holding coins in their own wallet, holding their own keys, it makes it a lot more difficult for the overall system to be captured, is how I'm seeing it. Now, of course, there could be bugs or malicious code in Bitcoin Core or in not just Bitcoin Core, but other applications that you, you use to interact with Bitcoin, potentially a wallet. So those are some things that are possible. Now, it's, you know, there are, the question is, would there be a showstopper bug, right? Like every, all code has bugs. The question is, would there be some showstopper bug that would really stop the overall show, right? Now, yeah. I think that's less, that's very unlikely, but it is possible. And it's something that people should be aware of. That is a risk. Um, so what can we, what can we do about all of these things, right? We've mentioned some of the risks. What can we do about it? So as we, um, we, we were referring to code before, code contribution and review, crucially. 
So this is something that people can do if you're interested, if you are uh, interested to go and learn about Bitcoin Core or other related projects. Uh, they are always looking for people who can do review. If anything, people who can review code and understand the code base and review it, that's actually more of the bottleneck than the people who are doing actual uh, code pull requests, as in making a new suggestion for code uh, to be put into Bitcoin to fix something or to improve some new feature or improve the scalability of the system, things like this. I see. So there's less reviewer now. Yeah. Um, yeah well i mean that's uh, one of the interesting things is that's just generally a thing with so with open source software so the reason yeah. for that is actually that a lot of people want to make code contributions but there's less mm. people who are capable and willing to go and do the review work mm. and review work is how bugs can be caught or um, yeah malicious code could be caught in review yeah and so that's actually part of the importance of this. Now, there are various organizations in the Bitcoin world who sponsor Bitcoin development. You may be an independent mm. contributor. You may be working for part of an, some Bitcoin development organization, or maybe even some of the Bitcoin exchanges and some of the Bitcoin companies sponsor Bitcoin developers also. So there's various ways this can happen. There's Blockstream, for example. There's Chaincode Labs. There is Spiral Bitcoin. Uh, HRF is funding. HRF stands for Human Rights Foundation. Alex Gladstein is also a speaker at this conference. So they are also funding Bitcoin development. Um, who else? There's Brink. Uh, there's oh, MIT Brink. DCI. Uh, there's more. I think there's Vintium, which is another one from uh, Brazil. Um, so there are more and more organizations like this. So, of course, it's a good thing to see. Um, mm -hmm. And that those are some of the ways that those bugs can be caught and stopped. Now, of course, one way is holding your own Bitcoin keys and verifying things for yourself. So that's what we talk about when we say step one is hold your own keys and step two, learn to run your own Bitcoin node. Now, in order to do that, you may use different tools. So for example, you may use Spectre Desktop. Now, Swan, uh, the company I work with, recently purchased Spectre Solutions. So Spectre Desktop is a great example where it's just uh, desktop application you can basically double click and just click next next install that application and it can bundle in a bitcoin node right in there now with that application you, you can have that on your laptop or your pc and then you can plug in your hardware wallet or you can do qr code air gaps so meaning you can hold up the qr code and scan, scan and sign your transactions in that way doing things you, verifying for yourself and so that's one easy way. Another way people are doing, let's say, those Raspberry Pi nodes, for example, uh, Umbral, Raspberry Blitz, Ronin Dojo, Start9, uh, Noddle, uh, MyNode, Nix Bitcoin, some of these other projects that are out there. Now, of course, you don't have to do that on a Raspberry Pi. You can just get an old computer, even an old laptop or an old PC, and you can run your own Bitcoin node that way. And in that way, you're verifying things for yourself. So the idea is you're not just doing it altruistically for the rest of you know, the network, you're protecting yourself to make sure nobody's scamming you and sending you fake coins. But if enough people do that, it helps protect the overall system because it becomes more robust and hard to cheat, hard to cheat the system. So those are a few things. Another idea is normalizing Bitcoin use, right? So if Bitcoin use is beco it becomes very normal and everyone does it, it becomes harder and harder to really ban it, over-regulate it, or stop this thing. So those are a few ideas. Um, of course, building out mining and improving the censorship resistance of the protocol helps also. There's a, there's a new protocol coming out. It's called Stratum V2. Now, it, it has been out for some time, but there's been some recent progress on this. Uh, so in terms of the benefits, it adds encryption to help stop MITM, man-in-the-middle attacks. Mm -hmm. So... Basically, the quick explanation of this is if you are a Bitcoin miner, there's a chance that somebody else could be hijacking your hash rate. Now, Stratum V2 can help stop this because it has encryption. It also <laughs> may uh, help you in terms of if you were trying to mine without other people knowing that you're mining, it might help a little bit in that way. And it can help decentralize the creation of Bitcoin block templates and make censorship even harder. Of course, 
building out mining infrastructure and having that in different countries, that helps. Uh, of particular assistance are the miners who are not public entities. Let's say people who just have some miners at their home. Sometimes they're not even mining profitably per se, but they're doing it because they want to acquire coins, non-KYC. That's one way mm-hmm. or because they ideologically want to support the network. So that's another thing that some people are doing out there. Um, in terms of improving the scalability, privacy, accessibility of Bitcoin, these are some examples. So for example, Lightning Network and other protocols that are out there. So for example, um, there are people working on different ideas such as coin pools or um, yeah, various ideas out there that can help people in terms of scaling Bitcoin and being and making it easy for people to access the network and use it in a non-custodial way uh, and by, keep, by doing it in certain ways that maybe that make it accessible from a cost point of view. Um, yeah. Privacy, things like, for example, in Lightning, when we open a channel together, currently, most people are just doing that on their own Mm-hmm. Say, I'm contributing all the Bitcoin to open a lightning channel. But in the future, if it becomes more normalized that let's say we both contribute some coin into opening that lightning channel together, then it actually helps from a privacy point of view. Um, so I won't get too into the detail of that because I'm trying yeah. to keep this accessible for people. But that just gives mm-hmm. you an idea that some of the directions things are going. Um, of course, taproot channels may help. CoinJoin obviously can help. So using let's say Samurai Wallet or Sparrow Wallet or Join Market as some examples. Um, now, as I mentioned before, there's full node projects and making it accessible, things like Umbral and Raspberry Blitz and so on. Um, wallets and other software. So for example, the way I see it is I believe people should try to onboard their friends using non-custodial software and wallets where possible. So. Um, a good favorite recently I've been trying out is Breeze. That's a good example. Um, that is an easy to use lightning wallet. Now we invested. So I, I, I was an investor in Breeze as part of Bitcoin Adventures. Uh, but I really like Breeze because it's non-custodial and it also has automatic cloud backup as well. So if you're onboarding a friend and they lose their phone, it has a, as it's got a cloud backup of that wallet so you don't look okay. they won't necessarily lose their coins right and yeah 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 in terms of doing lightning transactions if you're doing day-to-day spending with smaller amounts breeze is a great choice in my view um but of course i have an investment interest in breeze as well so obviously people should know that um but also lsps i think lsps lightning service providers so this you can think of this like a company or a platform that's helping make lightning accessible to the day, the end user. And so they can do things like open that channel for you in the background. They can help with balancing or swapping in and out. These are some of the examples of what a lightning service provider can do. We can also help ensure Bitcoin is not banned. So for example, if Bitcoin becomes broadly adopted, it's it's just politically difficult to ban or over-regulate it. So, I see this as primarily a bottom-up revolution, but there are people who are working from the top down also. So for example, Bitcoin Beach is arguably more of a bottom-up project, but from the top-down level, President Nayib Bukele put in a Bitcoin legal tender law and a Bitcoin law from the top down. So Mm -hmm. I think those are some examples where if we grow the base of Bitcoin users and particularly the ones who are trying to ensure that it remains free and open, then that's a good thing. We want that. So let's consider that. So look, yes, I've, I've gone through a lot of stuff, um, but just kind of summarizing the key points, it's not inevitable. Bitcoin relies on people to run and operate it and to help strengthen the system. So just summarizing, you can contribute code, you can organize a community meetup, you can help teach people, you can build or invest in Bitcoin companies. You can stack some Satoshis and use your own Bitcoin full node. And of course, your own Bitcoin wallet help normalize the use of Bitcoin. So if you have friends and you're going out for dinner, a common thing I've seen and I partake in as well is let's say the restaurant doesn't take Bitcoin. Well, maybe one person pays with the card and everyone else pays back their amount with Bitcoin uh, using Lightning. 
um, and of course, create and support the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin economy. So think about if you have a service, could you take Bitcoin for that? Um, could you uh, set up your own Bitcoin payment processing using tools like BTC Pay Server and things like this to support and help grow that peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin economy? Because all of these things that I've listed here, they all help drive this adoption and they all help strengthen the system because if you're sold on this idea of Bitcoin helping change the world and make it a better place, then you should try to do what you can. So that's how I would um, summarize that. And of course, I'm happy to take questions and um, discuss. So I'll stop the share there and I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with the bottom up first and then top down will came later. So uh, currently, um, we are having a bit of uh, I would say conundrum. So Bitcoin is currently is regulated as uh, commodities in uh, Indonesia, which prevent it to be uh, to be well. It's not it's not very legal or probably it's a gray area to trade them peer by peer to peer. Uh, so what do you think about that? Well, I think there'll be people who are able to sell their services online on the web. Mm. So mm. they could earn Bitcoin in that way. Mm. So that's one way. Um, of course, I'll see, I, I can imagine there'll be peer-to-peer -peer markets regardless yeah. of what the laws of the world yeah. are. Of course, mm -hmm. um, it will, for some people, yeah, it will be easier if it's legal. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also think, growing public support for the idea does help because fundamentally if everybody just sits back and says well the government just controls money and that's all it's never it, it's unlikely to change that way um and i think what will happen also is people will see that there's competitive pressure also to adopt bitcoin because if other countries excuse me if other countries are able to use this mm -hmm. it dramatically speeds up the ability to do transactions to do commerce um yeah. so i think it'll help from that point of view but yeah certainly if governments ban it well then of course it's going to make it difficult or over if they regulate it or it it's in a very difficult spot in a gray zone gray area it, it is harder for legal above ground adoption of course that that may end up pushing um you know things under the table it may push mm. things into people just doing it um you know outside the law let's say um, yeah so yeah that's uh, i guess that's all i can say there yeah so well over regulating it will will make it harder to regulate i guess yeah to grow the to actually grow the number of people using it now mm. i don't think now look it's possible that certain countries around the world ban it or overregulated, we are seeing some pretty tough regulations coming in the EU. But there are other parts of the world that are quite positive. So obviously El Salvador. I'm right now as we speak. I'm here in Lugano, and so they recently made made it a a de facto legal tender here in Lugano in Switzerland. So they are going around, uh, and so I went to the McDonald's here just to test it out. And you could pay you could pay with Bitcoin at McDonald's, and so That's that awesome. was incredible. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're going to make it available at a lot more shops and bars and restaurants around town. So that's cool to see. And the even the mayor here is very positive on Bitcoin. So we'll see what happens there. I know El Salvador also recently announced that they want to set up a Bitcoin office here in town in Lugano as like sort of a Bitcoin diplomat, let's say. So Let's see what happens there. I think what will happen is there will be competitive pressure and that countries all around the world will see, oh, okay, we have to compete for people because otherwise people will go elsewhere. And Definitely. that competitive pressure will drive them to provide better service for citizens and people in general. So, hmm. you know, we're seeing, as an example, we're seeing a lot of countries who are doing digital nomad visas, right? And I know, obviously... Uh, Bali in Indonesia is a digital nomad hotspot. 
Uh, I know there are efforts there around making a digital nomad visa. So I think that is an example that we will see. So we'll see that competition. Um, so long as you're being constructive and productive, that if you're bringing mm -hmm. in commerce, let's say if you are employing people or you're buying things locally, then there's a case to be made there. And so, yeah, you know, and that could also be an angle for some kind of lobbying organization who wants to go and lobby um, uh, politicians. Now, I, you know, I understand as well, people have reluctance about having to go lobby politicians because people would rather it just be a bottom up thing. Uh, but I think there's, there's some people who have an appetite to do that. Um, I'm not personally in that camp, right? I would rather just drive bottom-up adoption, but I also understand there'll be people who are happy to go and do that work. Uh, and you might even consider funding, helping fund that uh, because then they can help educate politicians and lawmakers and other people on why they should accept Bitcoin or why they should be open to this. And sometimes it just takes a conversation or the right education to the right person. And you have to start small. We, uh, you can't expect to just get from zero to 100 straight away. Um, you have to sort of, you have to start small and get to the people who you can get to. Uh, mm -hmm. And hopefully there's some kind of message of freedom that they can align with. And then they can use that either in their own campaigning or in their laws and regulations that they see, okay, there's actually a point to this. There's a benefit to this because let's say this, this number of people are earning money using Bitcoin, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, hopefully one of our attendees here have the appetite to do that. Like lobbying to a politician and something. Okay. And about the about the 51% tech. Uh, well, it's easy. Maybe it's easy to acquire uh, AC Griggs or something like that. But on the other hand, we also need to uh, create the energy infrastructure for that. And well, the energy infrastructure is currently it's proof of, proof of stake, so to say. Right. Proof so that's another stake. point. So you might have seen a good. There was a, I saw a recent thread by Drew Armstrong on Twitter as well. So he spoke about this exact point. He was saying, "Look, we might actually be hitting up against some of the energy constraints around the world as well, and getting like so there may be constraints in firstly in terms of getting that many ASIC machines because mm -hmm. it's it's like." The market is getting saturated for those. So even if, so let's say the Bitcoin price went to 100K or 200K, which are within possibility, it is possible, the network wouldn't even be able to scale up and get new mining machines in time. So that's one point. And then the other point you mentioned is having just finding that much energy that's available. So especially at the, at the current time when a lot of the world is going through some kind of energy crisis because of bad energy policies around the world. So I think you're right there also that it just becomes very, very difficult to practically capture the system. And the way I'm seeing it is it's not inevitable, as I mentioned, but it's very, very, very likely in my view that Bitcoin is going to get adopted. The question is more yeah. like if we can grow the system to the point where we can stop bad outcomes in the future. So if you can, if we could stop even now, I know there's a famous example where I think Andreas Antonopoulos was mentioning this back in 2015 or something, mm -hmm. but he was saying, look, if we could stop even one hyperinflation because people have access to Bitcoin, then it would have been worth it, right? Because all these people's lives would have been either saved or massively improved because they didn't have to go through the brutal consequences of high inflation. And the problem right now is many people around the world are going through this. And unfortunately, many people don't understand that Bitcoin is a big part of the answer. Now, I think they will eventually find us and they'll be in here with us. But if you have friends and family who you think you could get to, then I think that's something for listeners of this conference to think about. Now, the way I would mention it for people is not to try to ram Bitcoin down people's throats. It's instead you need to ask them the right questions so that they can understand the problems of fiat currency. Because only, only once you've understood that, then Bitcoin starts to make sense. If, you don't, if, if they don't understand that, then otherwise it just looks like, oh, these Bitcoin weird internet coin people, right? Like they just think, <laughs> oh, you guys are just 
some internet weirdo people and okay yeah. yeah you were transacting bitcoin i'm here just using my my credit card or whatever that's uh, that's, that's how they're thinking right mm -hmm. so it's important to be measured in how you go about this so that you don't totally just turn them off because i think that's another thing as well when people are really new to bitcoin they want to go out there and like tell every person and like uh, you know it's the greatest thing ever and look bitcoin is the greatest thing but uh you have to be uh measured in your approach and how you go about trying to teach people about it uh you have to almost inspire the curiosity in that other person and then only once yeah. they are curious about it to actually learn more and they're coming to you to ask oh yeah. hey how do i how do i use this bitcoin wallet or how do i get a hardware wallet or hardware device how do I, you know, buy some Bitcoin or how do I earn some Bitcoin? That's mm. the moment that you can then actually start teaching and saying, oh, okay, okay, download this wallet. Let's send you a small amount. You can learn how to use it, how to spend it, how to receive, things like this. And then, of course, if you are watching this conference now, because maybe you are new to Bitcoin and you're trying to learn a bit more for yourself, what I would say is put it into practice actually try to use some of these tools and that's the only way we're going to learn it's trial and error that's the only way people learn and oftentimes we have to make mistakes before we learn and that's the hard reality yeah. for many of us like when i was new to bitcoin i made many mistakes so many uh as i'm sure you might have and others have we actually only learn by doing it so what i would say is just try it start download a wallet try and have a small amount of Bitcoin sent there. Maybe buy a small amount from your friend, even if you give them a small amount and they send you some Bitcoin and then you take it from there. And then you try to learn more and read more, however you consume, right? Whether you listen to podcasts and you listen to my show or you read articles or you read books, there's all sorts of resources out there that you can use to go further down the journey. Um, and I would say, don't neglect that value of community also, because community is often how people uh, get together and then get motivated as well, because they might sort yeah. of talk to somebody else and now, oh, okay, that's what I'm meant to do. Oh, okay, I'm meant to learn how to run a Bitcoin node, or I'm, learn I'm trying to learn how to set up a Bitcoin meetup, or I'm trying to talk about how to be private um, with Bitcoin. The, all these different things that take time and work to learn. Um, so yeah, th those are some tips I would have for people. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I mean, we don't know if we don't try, right? Exactly. Right. Okay. So there's a question here, uh, uh, in, the, in our Q and A, uh, I know. So there's a question, uh, since Bitcoin proof of work is heavy on energy consumption, how are your views on the sustainability aspect? I see. Yeah. So look, personally, I believe we have to change the framing here. I don't like this idea of, oh, Bitcoin is unsustainable. It's actually the most sustainable thing. But really what we should be thinking about is getting more energy. And so if we look at his human history, the process of improving our lives has been about using more energy. And there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of people on earth who are either without energy or they are underpowered in terms of how much energy they are able to use. There's a lot of people who could do with a lot more energy. And so fundamentally, we just need to recognize Bitcoin is good. The benefits of Bitcoin are worth it in a way. We want to use more energy and I'm okay with that. Um, I, I, I promote it. I applaud it. We should be using more energy. That's part of the process of our civilization of humanity around the world getting stronger, more prosperous. And so I think a lot of the sustainability conversation comes in and generally it comes from a more left-leaning perspective where they think, oh, let's try to, I'm trying to minimize my impact on the environment. But they're neglecting some very real costs that humans are paying today. Uh, and also let's be clear here because I think it's important to understand the difference. What we should be comparing is not just Bitcoin's energy use versus other things, what we should be comparing is the Bitcoin monetary standard compared to the fiat monetary standard compared with mm -hmm. say, the gold money, the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And on the fiat standard today, there's a massive amount of war and bombing and think of how much energy goes into all the wars that governments go into with each other. 
could we yeah. arguably save a lot of that energy by going to a Bitcoin standard? Yes, I believe we will. Because ultimately, we are today in the world, yes, I understand Indonesians are transacting in Indonesian rupee, uh, but fundamentally, the world is still operating on a USD, US dollar standard. And it all head, it all goes down to how much energy is going into the wars and the militaries and the defense forces of these governments all around the world. So when you really zoom out and think about the cost of the overall monetary standard, the Bitcoin standard is going to be far, far cheaper and more prosperous to operate on. And so that completely, in my mind, that completely blows away any of these concerns about so-called sustainability because it's going to be worth it. We are going to be operating in a world where governments won't have as much incentive to keep being so corrupt or um, bureaucratic. And instead, it'll be more meritocratic. It won't be perfect, to be clear. I'm not a utopian. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we're going to live in, you know, perfect play, perfect utopia, but it'll be Maybe way better that. than what we have now. Yeah. And so the energy cost that we pay to get that is overwhelmingly so far worth it that it's crazy to me that people are like saying, oh, sustainability this, sustainability that. You know, fundamentally, I think there's been a lot of misinformation about energy, mm -hmm. about climate, about all of these things, such that people have, uh, like, they haven't sort of gotten clear on what the point of all of this was to begin with, right? The reason we use all this energy, the reason we do all this stuff is to live better lives. So the way someone like Alex Epstein might frame this is it's more about human flourishing, or it's more about actually creating wealth and mm -hmm. making it so that there's enough energy when, let's say, the incubator, right? So this is an example Alex Epstein uses, where there's enough energy for the incubator for a newborn premature child, that if we don't have reliable and cheap energy, then that's a problem. You won't have enough energy to save that child. And yeah. the world just fundamentally needs to use more energy. So what really matters is more this idea of cheap, reliable, scalable energy that's practical, it's pragmatic, it's economical as opposed to boondoggles that are not so cost effective, but they sound nice and the branding and the green and the lefties like it, but that's not pragmatic. That's not practical in my view. I see. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We want to, we want to, to strive for a peaceful world. And of course, spending energy right now rather than later is more preferred, right? In the Bitcoin standard, definitely. Yeah, I think fundamentally it just comes down to are we operating in an honest system? And the problem I see is a lot of the unreliable advocates, the wind and solar type people, they just end up pushing these completely unsustainable economically ideas. They they just don't they just selectively count in certain costs and don't count other costs and they don't count the benefits of living on fossil fuels and of nuclear also. Um, now, okay, I understand some of them are pro-nuclear, some of them are anti-nuclear, um, but that's the fundamental problem. And that's what we're, I, I, arguably, that's why we're seeing so much of this energy crisis today is because of a lot of feel-good, virtue signal -y style thinking and not a lot of pragmatism about actually what energy is cheap, reliable, works, and so on. Uh, and, you know, I, I, you see when countries really break down is, you know, they have trouble getting enough energy and enough fuel um i'm a sri lankan i was born in sri lanka right and the island of sri lanka was recently going through a lot of trouble um even just a few months you know back in like june it was hard to get enough fuel and so it's a massive problem it causes devolution yeah. in living standards there were people literally going back to getting around the village on their bicycle instead of like a motorcycle or a tri tri or tri you know three-wheeler or a car yeah. Because they just yeah. couldn't get enough fuel. It was a devolution yeah. because they were not able to use cheap, reliable, scalable energy with fossil fuels and things like this. So <laughs> I think the world needs to really have a wake-up call about energy. I agree with that. Okay, so uh, one last question. Is there anything you want to uh, say uh, to Indonesian watching this? Any well, other, I, other I'm things? hoping that more and more people start using Bitcoin, accepting Bitcoin, uh, looking for opportunities to grow that peer-to-peer -peer 
Bitcoin market, right? Whether you are, and this is especially important for you if you have an online skill set. So if you are, let's say you're a web developer, a programmer, a, you know, some other, any kind of job that can be done online. There are, I, I believe, a lot of opportunities. And I think what happens and I can see this also myself, right, in terms of when I look at people in Sri Lanka, I think mm. perhaps people get a bit close-minded into thinking, oh, I need to find a job here in Sri Lanka. But if you are able to work online, you are able, you can access jobs all around the world. And I think it's important to try to turn your eye to that and look at ways you can do that and ideally work and earn and save Bitcoin uh, and it, over the long run, people who have done that have done very well compared to people who just tr tried to do everything in fiat. So I understand it's not easy for everybody, but in some ways, it's, it's a, uh, over the long run, that's the easy part. But in the short term, sometimes it, it can feel a bit harder to do it that way. So yeah. I would, yeah, I guess I would leave it at that. And of course, just say, you know, whatever you can do to help grow the scene and grow the movement of bitcoin you know take that opportunity right if you can run a meetup if you can teach your family if you can teach your friends if you could find a way to um introduce it at your workplace if potentially if you can if people there are open to the idea maybe you could accept bitcoin there so those are a few ideas um and of course you know people can find me online stefanlevera.com and uh find me on the podcast app stefan levera podcast but yeah thank you for having me yeah, uh, we are. Yeah, I'm happy to host you here, here in uh, Indonesia Bitcoin Conference 2022 as well. So, um, are you, aside from the podcast and the website, are you reachable in anywhere else? Yeah, so of course, I, swan.com, um, email. I've got my email on my stefanlevera.com website. Okay. Um, so, yeah, if you got, if people have questions, they can email me there. Um, uh, yeah, I think those are the main places, right? It's stefanlevera.com okay. and swan.com are the main places right. to find uh, the things that we're working on. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, thanks, Stefan, for the for talk. And I guess uh, that's the end of our talk today. And I hope we will see you again soon. Great. Yeah, hopefully uh, sometime in person. So, uh, yeah, actually, I have visited um, Indonesia in person a couple of times. Um, couple of times in Jakarta um, mm -hmm. for a private uh, job. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, looking forward to it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Come visit anytime. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.